Uh, now's a great time to mention uh, that uh, after the presentations, usually people stick around a bit. Uh, and so hopefully, uh, Sandy, uh, you and your colleagues will be available to answer some more questions, <coughs> either about uh, Ludlow or uh, Locus. Absolutely. Awesome. OK, uh, I want to uh, briefly uh, thank our sponsors. Um, uh, we could not hold this event uh, without the University of Michigan uh, Law School Entrepreneurship Clinic. They were uh, very generous in helping us uh, find a home after ATV Tech was uh, briefly homeless a few years ago. Um, also, uh, Roger uh, is with uh, R2 Vive, uh, our, uh, our uh, uh, excellent uh, videographer, uh, both doing live streaming and uh, uh, uploading the events for Prosperity Online. And then um, also uh, A2 Geeks. Um, A2 Geeks is sort of a, a meta organization in Ann Arbor. Um, it helped facilitate a lot of um, geeky events and uh, uh, coordinating uh, uh, different groups to uh, get things together. Uh, so their support is also uh, greatly appreciated. Uh, OK, and then our next presenter is uh, Bitbox, to my knowledge, the only uh, Bitcoin startup uh, here in Ann Arbor. Uh, so my name is Kennard, and today I want to tell you basically three stories. The first story that I want to tell you is about Detroit. So as many of you know, Detroit's economy was wrecked in the 2008 financial crisis. Many neighborhoods were decimated by foreclosures. <coughs> in fact, my own home was foreclosed on. Uh, so the financial crisis left a lot of people reevaluating their relationship with money and the cacophony of financial instruments built on top. What many people found were systems that were antiquated and that rather than creating value, actually destroyed it. So the second story I want to tell you is about Bitcoin. So many of you know Bitcoin is an amazing peer-to-peer -peer technology. Centuries ago, you and I would pay one another for goods and services and a precious metal like gold and silver. But those are difficult and dangerous. To <coughs> so from there, we adapted paper checks. From there, paper currency. And from there, things like the debit card and the credit card. Well, all of these are systems to extend legacy technologies. So the money we use today wasn't made from the internet, and as a consequence, a lot of value is hidden and trapped. That's where Bitcoin comes in. Bitcoin offers us, for the first time, the opportunity to have a true global economy, and not just one in theory. It enables, for the first time in human history, instant global person-to-person -person payments. So what we really see happening is an entire new economy developing. And so at Bitbox, we want to build a firm that's positioned to bridge from this old economy to the new economy that we see forming. This is a huge problem. This is what Bitcoin block looks like. This is, in fact, actually a, a Bitcoin block. Some of you may have heard of these things. Uh, this is the first block, actually. And so for your grandma and really the average person, this is not the interface that they want with their money, and it's not the interface that they need for their money. And that's where we come in. So, what we're doing at Bitbox is basically building a layer above Bitcoin that enables people to interact in a way with it that makes it simple and easy to use. So what we built is a system that allows you to log in, type in a friend's name, the amount of money you want to send, <coughs> confirm the transaction, and then send it off. So to be clear, what we're doing now, we really see as a beginning, we're building a platform for people and ultimately it's our goal, it's our mission to empower people, to empower individuals, you, to create and transmit value. Um, and so really what that means is that, you know, what we're working hard to do is change the notion that, of money that people have because money is something that touches everyone and everything. So to give you a little bit better idea of what I mean by value, think about a telephone network. If there's only one person in the world that has a telephone, how valuable is that network? It's not valuable at all. If there are two people, it's kind of interesting, but if there are billions of people, then that network truly becomes valuable. Um, so if you guys are interested in joining our network and adding to the value and reaping from the value that we think we're creating, um, I encourage you to do so. And if you sign up within the first two weeks, there's some free Bitcoin waiting for you in your account. Okay. Questions? How do we sign up? Uh, so if you go to inbitbox.com, you can uh, In sign up for our private alpha bit. <clears throat> so are you actually storing the Bitcoins in a personal in a bank within Bitbox, or are you interfacing with the existing banks for Bitcoin? And how are you going to make sure they have a secure system there? Because a lot of these banks have been hacked in recent years. Right, right. 
Um, so, in fact, there was recently probably the most high profile hack of, of any Bitcoin company, Mt. Gox, which was once the largest Bitcoin exchange, was hacked. Um, and so, as a response to this, the community developed or is in the process of developing systems that can try to you know, prevent this sort of thing in the future. One of those systems is an open source um, accountability um, invention, really. Um, and it's, it's a way for you to know that you know, the bank actually has your money um, when they say they have your money. And so what we hope to do is to employ systems like this to make sure that, that our system is working the way you know, we say it works. Um, and, and we think we have an opportunity here to innovate. Um, and we're doing so by making our wallet completely open source. Uh, so, uh, in your example, I have uh, lunch with my friends. Uh, I want to pay them uh, back for the uh, the uh, even get together. Uh, how do uh, how do I figure out exactly how many uh, uh, bits or satoshis I want to, to pay them? Is there is there uh, some some mechanism in the interface to tell what the conversion is? If I can look up, yeah, it goes up from the dollar straight down. Yeah, so there's a little like text box on the corner of your screen that will show you actually um, what the conversion rate is. Okay. So are you in exchange, or where the Bitcoin is stored? Right. So, so we'll actually be storing the Bitcoins themselves, um, the ones that are stored with us on the service. So, in fact, we're also providing a storage service, um, making Bitcoin accessible for people when they're not, you know, at their home computer. Um, but at this point, we're not functioning as an exchange. There's another possibility that we may consider in the future, and we've actually done in the past. How would those coins be converted back into regular fiat currency? So you can convert in an exchange, and and so you know if we find out that's a value proposition that the users on the platform that we're creating really want, um, then that's something you know we'll look into the offer. So I just understand. So you, you, you're selling peer your payments, and you know Bitcoin is almost you know, you're trying to make a pay, right? And a bunch of other companies like you know Google Pay and other folks just tie this up to DA, so you got a deposit account to link up. Um, and, and the real value is again how how, how frictionless, right? Mm -hmm. the, the payments and, uh, uh, are made, not necessarily how much you guys are sort of saving on transaction fees of actually dealing with basically in DEA. What what what's sort of the uh, rationale behind um, you know like, like you know what what you know, Bitcoin is almost kind of like inconsequential, right? Because like, what you guys are doing it almost doesn't matter. Um, you know, what, what does the interface look like? What, what, what's sort of better about your peer right. payment system outside right. of the fact that it's actually backed by Bitcoin? Right. Um, I think, you know, the thing that I always try to emphasize is what we're really trying to do is build a platform for people. Um, because ultimately, it's people who create value, it's people who transmit value, it's people who consume value. Um, and, and so, <coughs> what, what we really want to do is, is, is build other things on top of this. Um, so for example, the metaphor that I always use is that Facebook started by letting people share photos and we're starting by letting people share money. Um, so right now, the, the functionality is very simple and it's a hypothesis that we're testing. Is this enough to bring people to the platform? One. Um, and then once they're already there, uh, we have a ton of other hypotheses about things we can offer them. There's an interesting company called TransferWise. So there's kind of the early sky guys. So they spun out a company that's just dealing with peer-to-peer -peer money transfer, mm -hmm. money exchange mm -hmm. across the border. Mm -hmm. Because you know, no one wants to pay the crazy you know, exchange fees. Um, but again, it, you know, the backing of it all is inconsequential. What's important is that they're able to kind of find that. So it's like a killer app. Right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So I would actually say the, the backing is pretty consequential. Because we're working with Bitcoin, we don't have the limitations that I think some of these other companies will deal with. Yeah. Um, there are other challenges, but you know, when it comes to sending money from one corner of the planet to the other instantly, nothing else can do that at this point. Um, so I think that does provide some edge for us, um, and then and then also, you know, there's so many other things we can do with Bitcoin um, that we haven't really explored yet. Yeah, do you have a mechanism for cold storage? Uh, yeah, so we're we're working on our our storage systems now. The site's not up yet. Um, uh, and we're planning on using Armory. So, and you know, we're we're probably going to do something eighty twenty, but at first, you know, that sort of thing we have to figure out. Thank you. <laughs> Another aspect of uh, of HU Tech. Uh,
that's uh, really great. <coughs> the opportunity for community announcements. Uh, so if there are upcoming community events, uh, if there are uh, chapel things, uh, if there are uh, other public things that are going on, uh, after this presentation, we're going to have some time to do some uh, announcements. Uh, and then I guess while we're getting set up, uh, I wanted to quickly announce that uh, this Thursday, uh, Coffee House Coders is meeting at Morgan Town Exchange. Uh, if you've never been, it's a very uh, informal place where you can go and um, work on uh, programming projects with uh, other people uh, who uh, are uh, developers of all sorts of uh, skill levels. It's a great place to go, particularly if you're looking at a new uh, language or framework, because you get questions. There's sort of other people who are also learning, and you know, maybe you can sort of help each other out. Uh, other upcoming uh, geeky events uh, on Sunday, uh, April 6th, is uh, Festive Events. If you've never been, you really need to check this out. Uh, basically, uh, a whole bunch of University of Michigan students, uh, and this year, uh, Ann Arbor community members um, construct these like 16 foot tall puppets, and they parade them down Main Street. Uh, it's a great family friendly event. Uh, they actually have an open call for makers, uh, and so if you are the type of person that likes to make things, if you want to construct your own puppet and participate in uh, uh, festivals, that's an option. Uh, the Friday before that, April 4th, is also uh, Full Moon, a more adult oriented uh, street party uh, right outside. Uh, uh, Chris and Pete, and sort of that like uh, uh, Ashley Washington uh, corridor. Uh, so that's another event that I would highly recommend checking out. Okay, uh, and now please welcome uh, Rich from Red Book. Hi everyone, my name is Rich Chang. I'm a founding partner of a firm called Foundry. We're a brand name design and engineering firm based here in Ann Arbor. And I'm here today to talk about Rambook, which is the first in a suite of enterprise level applications that we're releasing here in 2014. So you're probably wondering what exactly is Rambook. Uh, before I get to that, I'd actually like to do two quick questions. Who here regularly attends or runs meetings? Okay, right, right. Uh, how many of you actually enjoy being in those meetings? Sometimes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you know. <laughs> this is probably why, right? They turn out they're a large waste of time, and it's usually because they're running inefficiently, and they start rambling, getting off topic, and it just gets a severe toll paid to actually be a participant, and also to actually run, and also actually uh, speak in one of these meetings. So New Foundry decided that we wanted to actually tackle this and solve this problem. Uh, solve this problem. We may not be able to bring joy to a meeting, but we can at least hopefully bring some efficiency. Um, via software. So our approach was based around these four objectives uh, with the main purpose of eliminate wasteful ramblings, remove politics from managing the meeting, which actually can be problematic, um, improve team performance, use resources wisely, and also drive discipline and promote good meeting practices. So who is our target user? Pretty much anyone that runs a meeting. Um, you can just go through that entire list. For us, like the virtual worker was actually one that I'm pretty sure a lot of us are starting to experience more and more. This is like a lot of companies are not just located in a particular spot, they have developers and members throughout the nation and throughout the world. The use cases are plentiful, daily scrums, weekly project meetings, even just conferences that folks are trying to run. So the result of our research and user testing is Ramblehub. Uh, it's a simple but proper way to basically reel in meetings. It's currently in iOS, but we actually have an Android version that's supposed to be finished by the end of this month. So based on those four objectives, Rebel has these key features. Uh, we actually have two versions, a free version and a pro version. Uh, the free version and the pro version both have efficient timers, input and save your meeting agendas, anonymous feedback bar, uh, attendee count, being able to share the meeting, and also post meeting analytics, which I'll dive into here now. The pro version right now, the only difference is, is that the pro version allows you to create and moderate unlimited meetings. Uh, we actually have a roadmap of additional features that we pro, but they'll be coming up here in the next couple of months. So creating a meeting. Uh, one of the main goals is to make sure that it's actually simple to use, uh, not just elegant, but also user friendly. It's a three-step process. You press create. Add in your agenda items with the description of speaker and time, and then press start. It starts from there. We also have an ad hoc agenda meeting where you don't have to fill in the details. You just plug in the number of agenda items you're going to have and the time each of those, and just hit start in that case. So once you actually create a meeting, you actually want to share this with your participants, either via email, or we actually have the ability for them to actually just give the meeting idea, uh, meeting idea over the phone. There's two codes, the main one for your participants to give you the meeting, 
code, which is the top one up here, is cell letters. And we also provide a moderator code so that you're not the only one controlling the you can actually have co-moderators. So the key uh, portion, or the key purpose of the app is, of course, to keep uh, folks in sync and on time. So the easy interpret timer is, is a core functionality. It has three modes. The green mode, which looks a little limey here, but I'm going to play that on a projector. Um, that is actually to tell the, the speaker presenter that, hey, you're actually within your allotted time. You're doing pretty good. The orange, uh, there's actually a form that gives you a, war a warning that basically says here, time is going to expire. And then the red is, of course, that you're actually over your time. So the red indicator, I want to dive a little bit more into that. You'll notice that there's actually no pause or stop button through this application. That's actually on purpose, because we don't want to cut the presenter off. We want to allow them to continue talking, but this is actually a way to motivate them to be able to finish what they're, what they're discussing. The feedback bar, this is anonymous feedback that uh, all the participants can actually provide. It usually helps the presenter or it also helps the actual meeting moderator. Uh, the slow down is the cases where people are just talking so fast, we're like, whoa, like, can you please give us a little more detail as to what's going on here? Or the speed up where they're just dragging and going on and on and on. You're like, hey, you know what? We can move on to understand we're, we're on board here. So the meeting recap. This is at the end of the meeting. It basically has a gauge of how did we actually do. Uh, we have a breakdown by agenda item, who rambled, who didn't, the overall <coughs> time, overall time ramble for saves, and we actually improved. So in summary, with the ramble hook, we have productive meetings by automating time keeping tracking, uh, keeping functions, keeping presenters on track, and enabling real-time real -time feedback from your participants. That's it. How do you know, um, who, how do you like a lot and schedule times for people? Like sometimes somebody has 10 minutes of stuff to go over and somebody just has a yeah. short comment. So that's actually part of the, that, that was done on purpose. So a lot of times it's just kind of estimating. Um, we're mainly trying to have the, the app uh, be utilized in situations where there's going to be recurring meetings because then you can actually try and drive efficiency for future meetings after that. Because we'll say, oh, you're like, Rich just rambled on for like 20 minutes. But if we keep a lot of 10 minutes, so either we just tell Rich to bring it in, or we just started a lot of 20 minutes to Rich to get a chance to talk. Thanks. Do um, all meeting uh, participants typically have it and they're watching it, or, or you're, the people who are using it, are they projecting it? What, what have you seen? Um, How it's so used? Right now, it's, it's only uh, mobile based, but it actually works really nice on an iPad. So we've actually had it used at a couple conferences where they just set the iPad up so that the actual audience could see it, and they also had a version for the presenter to see it in that case. Um, we are working actually on a desktop version so that folks can actually follow on without a mobile device. Uh, but yeah, it's just however you want to use it, you can actually, uh, yeah, I mean, this would be perfect for here. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Do you have any competition? Uh, you know, it was interesting. So when we started listening to us, it was mainly because we were trying to rein in our own meetings, because uh, we would have like 15 minutes to 30 minute meetings that turned into like an hour and a half. And it wasn't that it was completely inefficient, it's just we started going to all these different topics. Uh, so we started looking for something and we couldn't find anything out there. There's a lot of timer asks, but nothing that really allows you the agenda. Because one of our goals is actually to um, tie it, for instance, with like WebEx or GoToMeeting, where then they can actually follow along. Because one of the biggest complaints is I get on these conference, video conferences, and they throw a slide of the agenda, and then for the rest of the meeting, I'm going to go like, what's coming up next, and where are they going with this? Yep. Well, I think we can do that. Um, do the speakers run into the trap of uh, being entertaining versus um, useful content? Uh, well, that's a really good question. I mean, in Raleigh, it's, it's really up to the speakers and how they actually want to present the techniques they want to use. This is more of just a tool of basically trying to enable them to understand, hey, you know what, I think I need to actually slow down and explain more of what I'm talking about, or speed it up and move on to the next subject that they may not be discussing. So are people just sitting around with their iPhones and their Android phones and Yeah, that's plugging? a good question. So uh, it actually gets visual and audio feedback. So in reality, <coughs> you can't have this in front of you. Like, we're hoping that the folks aren't just going to sit there watching this. <laughs> um, but it also gets audio. Uh, part and then a ding at the end. 
Yeah, so we launched this about a month ago, and actually we didn't do much of our PR, because in reality, our target audience is uh, enterprises, and so we're working with uh, a hospital right now, and then our goal is to get into large corporations to actually sell them site licenses. So for us, the free version is more just for like, all of us to use as regular right consumers, but the pay and where we're gonna make money is actually selling it to uh, enterprise uh, corporations. So right now we have, uh, we're selling, or we're having about like two to five downloads a day, which isn't too bad because we're doing zero marketing on this right now. Yep. So now instead of concentrating on meeting, people will have another toy to play with. I mean, it's a distraction if I'm conducting meetings. <coughs> I want my people to focus on the agenda or the discussion. Sure, sure. so that's why actually for us, like the optimal setup in reality is if it's like a local meeting, like if there's a group here, is you have an iPad and you have a meeting monitor that controls it, and at least a display that they can actually, everyone can actually see, and they're not having it on their phones. The benefit of having the sync uh, sharing capabilities is for a lot of those folks that are actually remote. Because in reality, if they're via the phone, they're probably got the kicked up, Netflix playing on another iPad or something, right? So it's not going to really help them too much anyways to control that. And they know you know the inside the other yeah, that's the next. So uh, some of the future uh, versions is to tie it for instance like Outlook, Google Calendar, for getting the more details of the agenda items and being able to also suck that information in. Um, taking meeting notes, I'm not sure if that's something that we're going to do at this time, but definitely tying in with those particular calendar services. How can tie into those that be better? Because the way I see it, like, so there's so many things I have to do to get to a meeting, like, I have to fill out this, and, like, you know, there's so many things you have to get set up before a meeting happens, where yeah. this would be yeah. just one more thing, so. Yeah. yeah, so we are actually working also on a desktop version for being able to input in the agenda items. Because um, right now, doing it on the, on the phone, it's really not, it's not super enjoyable because you have a small little keyboard. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Community announcement time. Yeah. Um, uh, if anyone is interested in learning or chatting more about Bitcoins, come to the Michigan Bitcoiners meetup. We have two meetups this week, one in Ann Arbor, um, in Angel Hall, uh, in Fishbowl, Hashem City this Wednesday at 7, and one in Farmington Hills at the Bronx Deli, um, success at Bitcoin. Right? So, um, and join our meetup.com group um, if you want um, reminders, so thanks. No fiat currency allowed. <laughs> Hi, I just have two events that I wanted to share with everybody. Um, I'm Commander Bruce Barkley, the training campus, and we have an event coming up next Thursday on March 27th. It's called A2 Tech Connect, actually, or like pretty similar to your name. And it's meant to be a sort of informal job seeking networking event. So we have over 10 companies with a total of over 100 jobs that are current open positions with companies within the Ann Arbor area. Um, the event is going to be at Kensington Court from 4 to 6 next Thursday, March 27th. I've got a really small flyer here with a list of the different companies that are going to be involved. Some of them are Workforce Software, Longsoft, Longbow Advantage, uh, we've got TD Ameritrade, Line CG on here. Like I said, over 100 jobs all in the IT industry sector. Um, and <clears throat> pretty informal networking event. It's not really a job fair, even though that's what it says on here. It's meant to be more of a <coughs> place where you can sort of talk to the employers and get to know them. Um, suit and tie is optional, so come on, read like. Um, and the other event that we have is on April 4th and 5th, and this sort of came about um, and was presented to us uh, through a connection with an incubator down in Redwood, California called Nest GSB. Um, they are conducting a connected vehicles hackathon on April 4th and 5th. Um, it is California time, so it's a little odd as far as the hours go for us Michigan people. Um, it's going to be from 9 p.m. on the 4th until 11 p.m. on the 5th. Um, and as a lot of you probably have heard, there's a lot of connected vehicle technology activity going on here in the state as well as at U of M. Um, and they reached out to us and asked if we wanted to collaborate. So we will be um, having company sponsors provide challenge tracks. There are a number of cash prizes available. I'm going to catch you up. Can you just post the links to it uh, at uh, a2newtech.org yeah. on the events? And sure. then, so Sorry. people have the information that way. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. And I think we had one or two more announcements. Yeah, so I'm, I'm Chris from TG Ameritrade. Um, <coughs> we're looking for a few developers to join our new Advanced Technology Center downtown at Maine and Huron. 
um, and playing in the back. We actually have a couple directors visiting from out of town too, so feel free to talk to us. Uh, yeah. Awesome. And then maybe one or two more announcements. Um, I'm actually working on two big projects. One is for career uh, learning about careers, and um, so you can find out what any job is. And then as you're finding out what that job is, the system will learn about you, and it will analyze all the 40,000 different career opportunities that are available, and it gets you like a top 10. That's one project, and I'm actually working on a second project that organizes conversations in web pages. Um, it learns like the emotional intelligence and the knowledge level of the users, and then how that's how it ranks things. In the <laughs> so if anyone's interested, I'll be glad to talk about it. And I'm looking for developers. Cool. Hi, um, my name is Debbie Freer. I'm with the Ann Arbor Area Transportation Authority. Um, many of you probably know that we do have a millage on the ballot uh, May 6th to improve transit service in Ann Arbor, Ypsilanti, and Ypsilanti Township. Uh, it's 0.7 mills for five years. We're talking about a 44% increase in transit service. Um, that equates to about 90,000 additional service hours um, in the area. Uh, it includes later night service, more weekend service, better bus stops, and uh, more redesigned routes to, uh, to um, shorten your travel time as well as your wait time. Uh, and it also included is um, more frequent uh, bus service and better bus stops. So I will be here if anybody has any questions or if you'd like some information, I'd be happy to give that to you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. We're definitely going to mention that at the next one as well. Uh, at OLAP, we are a huge fans of the Go Pass program. The only complaint is that the DDA zone isn't big enough. Okay. Yeah. If you need somebody from the ride here, let me know. Right. Uh, real quick, um, Sandy again with Locus. Um, uh, we, I didn't mention earlier, we are trying to add to the team. Uh, we're looking for UI, UX, we're looking for QA, we're looking for mobile developers. Uh, anyone who's interested, let me know. Okay, well, we'll have one more slot for community announcements, but I'm going to hand the stage back over to uh, Notify. So take away, guys. Thank you. Everybody, I'm Adam. This is Sam. We're two of the co-founders for Notify. And to start, I want to introduce you to Jilly, and you're getting the widescreen version today. Uh, letterbox. Uh, meet Jilly. Jilly, uh, when she graduated from her undergraduate at George Washington University, she went and worked in her dream job, which was at a newspaper in Washington, D.C. She met some amazing people and did what we all do when we meet amazing people, which is she connected with them on LinkedIn. She then moved papers in the district and met some more people, connected with them. She then moved to New York, met some more people, et cetera, and et cetera. The problem was, after she got to that coveted 500 plus metric on LinkedIn, her network felt a little, a little crowded. Uh, Jilly's actually a real person, and this is a pain point that both Sam and I and the other folks we're working with feel on a regular basis, that we have too many people in our networks, and even though we're more connected than ever, we don't really have relationships with all these people. Uh, Jilly talked about losing track of the important people she met in Washington, not having the right tools to keep in touch, and frankly not having the time. So she tried to solve this, as most of us might, with uh, an Excel spreadsheet, multiple tabs, lots of rows and columns. And then she did what most people do after that, which is she gave up. The pain point that we're trying to solve and that she talked about and that the 30 or 40 customers that we've talked to and the 170 individuals that we've surveyed is that they're, they're, they have this feeling that their network is getting cold. Some of the stats we got from our survey is that 87% said that they're having trouble staying in touch with people that matter to them. And partly that's because most of them say that there's too many to keep track of, right? Just like we heard from Jillian. 77% said that the tools they currently use just aren't getting the results that they require. And when we dove in deeper with those 40 conversations with uh, potential customers, what we found is that it's too manual, right? So this Excel spreadsheet or doing it on paper just doesn't cut it. LinkedIn doesn't have the tools, although it has the capability. Uh, potentially, it doesn't have the tools to do it. And lastly, 70%, which we realize this is a survey, so people will say that they will pay for things, it's high. But 70%, we think, is a pretty good indicator that people think this is a pain point. The other place that we see this arise is in LinkedIn's daily active usage. So this is, uh, and I'm sorry, it's a little light, but uh, the, the light bar across shows daily active users across social networking platforms. LinkedIn's is one of the lowest. And in their 10K financial documents, they say that's one of their biggest threats to their business, is that users don't come back on a regular basis. So we think that's a large opportunity uh, to fix. <laughs> so we've come up with two points that, that we're working on now. We've, we've got an iOS prototype, um, and we'll be releasing it in the store in, in the coming month. 
So two points. I think, firstly, everyone's got way too many people in their networks, so we want to focus that down. So we're, we've got a rank algorithm uh, that we're working on, and basically to highlight the people that are kind of most relevant to you on a contextual basis and just show them in a graphical way, right? And right now, kind of what we need to beat is LinkedIn's uh, alphabetical. So if you go to LinkedIn, it's like you can do the search, you can do the advanced search, you can do a lot of this stuff. But to be honest, it's just a couple steps that is too many. So the second piece is giving like relevant reasons. Um, we were basing it kind of on the UI, if people have used Google Now, um, something similar to that, of just bring up some reasons and whether it be articles, um, and say, hey, look, this person is just changed jobs. This article is really relevant to them. Reach out to them. So that's kind of the top part. Or highlight people that are, say, you know, Boston Red Sox just won the World Series. Here are kind of the six people that are like, huge Sox fans. You know, good touch point in that sense. So that's the kind of thing we're looking for. So like, first part is focus your network. So bring up the people who actually matter and kind of de-highlight de the people that don't really matter in your network. Um, and then the second part is really give you, try to figure out really contextual reasons um, that that will be useful to you. So kind of in this space, context, contextual apps, right? So with mobile, with mobile you have location, you could plug into your Gmail, you could plug into your uh, calendar. There's a lot of data that we could pull in and actually give really relevant reasons. And these kinds of apps, the apps are doing really well, are getting financed and actually uh, purchased. Um, the third piece of it is that apps, you know, most people like free, um, but within kind of the productivity business apps, um, a lot of people actually tend to pay for them. So the, the top 10 business apps, 50% are actually paid. That's kind of our space. So our team, right now we're, we've got six people. Um, three of them actually previously worked at Microsoft. Um, so we've got basically three MBAs, three developers. Um, it's been a really good balance. We've been working on this for the last three months, um, and we're gonna have a prototype um, early April. And so in terms of what we need, um, I've been working on the UI side, I'm not a UI guy at all. Um, so we, I'd love to get that on board. Um, the second piece is I think we've got a, data, um, a guy who can work on the algorithm side, but we'd like to pull in much more on the machine learning aspect. So if there's any expertise in the, out there, I'd love to talk with you. Um, and then back in our architecture, we're looking to do Heroku or Azure. So if you have an opinion on that, I would love to hear that. Um, and then finance, financing, we'll be looking for probably in early May. So that's us. Cool. Thank you. So there's a bunch of, there's a bunch of apps kind of built, built off of LinkedIn, like with Newsly, which I find pretty, pretty useful, right? Yeah. Um, what, um, and, and you know, obviously LinkedIn themselves are they're doing forums, they're doing groups, they're doing their, 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 their news feed. Um, you know, what's, what's different or special about kind of how, what you guys intend to hopefully present? Yeah, I think on like a, like I felt this a lot emotionally, like Instagram for example, um, when it first came out when you had 20 of your closest friends, it was really, engagement was really high, and I think engagement is still high, but I think amongst my friends I've seen it drop off as well. Exact same feeling, I think, with LinkedIn, right? You have, I have 850 people in my network, and I see the entire news field. In fact, it's kind of emotionally draining to go through that infinite scroll. Um, not only is it, most, most things are quite useless to me, um, but also there's just too much. So I think by kind of figuring out on the rank algorithm and say, hey, these are the people that we think are most important to you, and then highlighting that, and kind of flipping it a little bit. I think the second thing is the direct proactive sharing. Yes. Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, it's I can talk to the world and I don't have to talk to any of you individually. Mm -hmm. What we're trying to change is to flip that to say, hey, I haven't talked to you in a while. Here's this thing that made me think of you. How's life? And the power of that was Jilly, we sort of explained what we were doing and asked her to come in and we would do this for her as consultants. So we would actually go find, data. you know, here's your people on your LinkedIn, pick six people. I'd go find reasons and then give her to send them to her people. And she came back and said, I would pay for this app. This is powerful. This is helpful. And she showed me the five emails she got back from the five people. So it's a different way to interact than it is just a spam world. Mm -hmm. uh, I understand why it's hard to use LinkedIn for this, but I don't quite understand what you guys are doing. I mean, I understand the problem. I just don't understand your solution. So what exactly is the algorithm that you're using, and why can't LinkedIn just implement something similar very quickly, and why haven't they already? 
Uh, really good cool question. Do you have a good answer? Yeah. So <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna pass it to my co-founder. <laughs> that was good. So I, I heard three questions. Um, Let's start with LinkedIn. We think they are trying to do this, but I don't know if it's about being on LinkedIn, but what I get is like, hey, congratulate Sam, he's been in grad school for two years, it's an anniversary. That is not a reason for me to stay in time, Sam. Um, so we just don't think they're executing very well. Two, the, the, there's two pieces of it to it. Uh, actually, let's see if this is here somewhere. So <coughs> we would use API data from a number of different social networks, essentially a layer on top of them, but not only, we pull them in. So for example, uh, what's your name? Doug. Doug. So Doug's in my social network. I haven't talked to him in six months. Somewhere in the world, it says that he likes design and business, right? So the app says, hey, uh, based on that information, and because he's in your 150, you should send him this article that uh, IDEO wrote, right? So the algorithm, relates more to who is going to make it into your 150, less to, well, I guess it relates to what you're going to make too. But so, so who you, who's interested, who it should be in your network, go find something they're interested in, find something to send them, and then come back. So that's kind of the secret sauce. Is that to answer your question? So I, I kind of just highlighted the articles, but I think that, you know, another use case we're playing with, and Google now does this really well, is you're going to New York City in two weeks time, they give like flight updates. I'd love to also know, like, oh, here are the 20 people I haven't reached out with that I actually care about. Highlight them and just make it really easy for me. I could do it on LinkedIn, but I never do, you know? And then suggest a cafe that you guys should eat and drink at. And right. Maybe that's a revenue exactly. potential right. so at some point as well. Less than that, yeah. So say I'm looking to change careers or change a city. Can I tell the app, like, if I'm in environment now and I want to be in finance to change the algorithms to look that way? My, my guess is actually when you have something really specific, like you're looking for a job in New York City, like LinkedIn's actually really suited for that use case, um, where you know exactly what you're searching for. They've got the advanced search thing. You can, and so I, I don't think that would be the use case. I think it's more, you know, on a daily basis, like what's going to make it a little bit easier for me to just kind of keep my network a little bit warm, like keep thinking of, keep people top of mind. Well, that's a guess. So you know, if, I think th these things will change as we. And related to that, we don't want to compete necessarily with LinkedIn. We'd yeah. like to be a complement because that's one of the our exit strategies would be right. to help out. I think the thought was like, okay, I'm thinking of going into finance now. Like, pull people out of my woodwork that yeah. are in alignment with that. So like, who do I? Who did I meet in the past five so years that I forgot Canadian, about? So you can sign up at getnotify.com, and then you can tell us that when, when you sign up. That. So, yeah. And I saw Hannah and Wes. Yeah, so this is, this is a great idea for only thinking out to your audience, uh, your, your, your network group, but on a receiving side, um, if this somehow reaches scale, being sent 200 emails from a bunch of people who are all trying to reach out with, they all say the same thing, it's probably going to get pretty annoying. How do you deal with that? We just ran out of time, so no, I mean, <laughs> that's a great question and one that, uh, honestly, I, I hope that is a problem that we have to because that means we'll be at scale. I don't have a perfect answer for that yet, uh, but it is something that we're trying to figure out. Um, certainly, it would, uh, we would lose our value if that was the case. So it, whether it's taking you out of, some, of many people's rotation because someone talked to you or taking out the reason they reached out, we need to figure that out. Yeah. Honestly. Okay, uh, community announcements, uh, round two. Uh, there's a long news period for hiring. Who else is hiring? Raise your hand. And companies that are hiring, raise your hand. All right, who's looking right now? All right, well, no, let's find another thing. <laughs> I think you could probably go to any uh, Ann Arbor company and throw slash jobs out there and then, you know, if you're talking about dual security or OLARC or TD Ameritrade or, yeah, farm logs or, yeah. Well, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. In addition to farm logs slash jobs, which Zach already mentioned, I'd like to highlight. <laughs> uh, we're also co-hosting a hackathon or a hack night on Thursday uh, within the community here in Ann Arbor. It's in Palmer Commons at uh, 6.30 on Thursday, two days from now. So come join us. Come and hack on anything. I think yeah. I actually, uh, it's just a, it's a. I think it's with a student organization called Hack Nights. It's literally just called Hack Nights, and it's very casual. I don't know if anybody's been to uh, 
screw it, ship it would be the appropriate. <laughs> Yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah PG-13 uh, version, but it's a similar night, just come and work on stuff. If you have any questions, uh, I think we have details at farmworks.com, uh, or just contact me or something. Um, I actually don't know if we have anything up. Thanks. Yeah, Wes. Wes, University of Michigan. Uh, one of our startups that's coming out will be looking for a CTO, head of product. Um, we'll have an MVP when they launch, but uh, that will be uh, probably within the next month. If you're interested in something like that, come over see me. I'll give you a card and get you connected. All right. Okay. Uh, we have uh, one last presenter, uh, and like I said uh, previously, um, usually people stick around for a while afterwards. Sometimes there's also a contingent that goes to uh, Pizza House afterwards. Just show of hands, is anyone interested in potentially going to Pizza House afterwards? Okay. Yeah. So we'll probably hang out here for a little bit, and then uh, maybe head to a uh, house for uh, dinner and some uh, drinks. Okay. Please welcome uh, MCAT. Uh, yes. Hi, I am. Oh, sorry. I am Kalina. Uh, so last year around this time, maybe about two weeks back in February, I got the idea for a social network geared around studying for the MCAT. I got this because I took the MCAT myself. I was an MCAT uh, tutor for a number of years, and I was actually looking at fitness apps. And I was like, oh, I love calculating all my data and comparing it and graphing it and studying it. And then I thought, wait a minute, why don't we do this for standardized tests? Everyone's taking the same test, using the same prep books, taking the same practice test. Why can't we use this data, get it organized, and everyone can benefit from it? So just to guys, take you guys through a little introduction of why this uh, solution to a problem. The MCAT is a really tough, long, arduous test, and the process, process for it is even worse. So a lot of students dread it, they feel alone, they begin to just uh, have a tough time and they really need a lot of support. They'll often find themselves feeling like they're the only one in that situation. They're constantly comparing their scores with the score they feel they need to get in. And they're always feeling like, I'm not doing as well as everybody else. They want data. They want to know. They want to talk to their peers, but at the same time, they don't really want to share how they're doing. So everyone's kind of in this really tough circle together. So the idea that, that I'm presenting here is for a more positive network where they can gather and everyone can use this data together to have progress forward and everyone can do better together. So uh, you've probably heard the stats saying that there's a large uh, lack of doctors in the US, especially primary care physicians. Well, there have been a lot of students following up saying, hey, let me take the MCAT, let me go to med school. These numbers have been increasing, so it's a great market to take advantage of. In addition, 80% of the students that take the MCAT every year are spending $2,000 or more on MCAT prep. They've got their pocketbook open already. We need to give them something worth buying. And also, they're also doing a lot of study time. They need that time to be organized. Otherwise, they're wasting their time, wasting their money, wasting their health and their sanity. And they're already trying to find a solution. So one has been taking the top of <laughs> And they're constantly trying to share. these. Students are reaching out, whether it's on Tumblr, this is a screen grab from YouTube. You have a community just on a single YouTube post. They're really asking for a consolidated <laughs> way to get all this force together. This is a screen grab from a test prep company shared on Tumblr. Now what if we can get all of these together? In terms of the market position for MCAT.me, the biggest competition you're going to think is the, the regular uh, um, contemporary um, classroom test prep. Yes, you've got online video, but it's still separated. You've got you and you're one at 20 in a class. You don't talk to anybody. We need to get everyone together, moving forward together. The other thing is going to be online forum, where it's just really tough to be in those forums. People are not very supportive. This is a quote. <laughs> this is a quote. Um, let me read it for you. Uh, someone left or someone says, you are not going to get into, into an MD school with a GPA that low, and they finish off by saying, you'll even have trouble with most DO programs, you wouldn't get an interview at mine. Oh, gee, great, thanks for sharing that. Okay. <laughs> All right, so in terms of monetization, the whole idea is to do this around a low monthly subscription. So for about the same that a student would be paying for the Netflix account every month, you would give them a great way to be confident and prepare for their MCAT. It's going to appeal to students that are self-studying on their own because it's going to be low cost. They're going to get that organization that they're really paying $2,000 for when they go into the classroom. They really just want someone to tell them when to study and what. And then for the students that are going to take that classroom option, they're going to like it because they're going to have a supportive network. They're not going to feel alone in a classroom where there's 20 of them, but they've never talked to anyone. They don't feel comfortable. So we have an anonymous, uh, we'll 
anonymous if you want outlet to share that. So let me give you a glimpse of what is here today. So this is mcat.me in its current form. It is live. And there are live demo, woo! Uh, so there are some students on here. And what they create are profiles for themselves where they are sharing their study plans. So let's just take a look at this person. So here you have what they're studying on a particular day. Here are chapter two, isomers, and it tells you they've done that one. And so they're going to keep track of these every day, and they can create multiple study schedules. And here's a great feature. Everyone's practice tests can be consolidated together. So this looks kind of sparse because it just went live um, for people to sign up a few weeks ago. But imagine this starting to fill up. You're really going to get a lot of data to benefit from. So that's the beginning of MCAT.me. Thanks for uh, Is that me? Um, so you mentioned that a lot of other anonymous forums are not supportive. How do you ensure that yours is going to be supportive? I think that when you're providing a product for someone, if they're paying for it, you owe them the responsibility to monitor the community. And if someone is not giving the right attitude, it's not welcome. That's it. So you kick them out, do you refund them? Depends, uh, well, I'll refund the next one. We'll prorate it. <laughs> In the back, yes. Are you, are you at all concerned about MCAT itself as a registered trademark? Are you at all worried about the owners being litigious with you or being MCAT that me? Uh, I did, which is why I called up ADMC and asked them that very question. And they told me that as long as I give notice that I'm not the owner of this trademark, that as long as it's used in the URL, like any other test prep company out there is using it the same way, that I'm in the clear. So I got it from the horse's mouth. Yes. Uh, how many students do you have involved with your program right now? So um, as I was building this up over the past um, six to eight months, the major development was, I did a beta, a beta where I was introducing students. So I had about 59 students in the beta that are just helping me to get the site going, seeing what kind of tweaks need to be worked out. And in the past three weeks since I've launched it, I've gotten about a dozen, maybe 15 students coming in creating free profiles and two students that have signed up for subscriptions so far. Oh, and I also have um, like five or six students in my 10-day free trial period, so I'll and, and what's the expected subscription price for a year for someone to participate in this? So right now my subscription price is $12 per month unless you want to pay up front for six months, then it's $35, pay for the whole year, it's $69. Wow. Yes. Is there collaborative study material? <laughs> One feature that I'm in the works of building, um, I actually did have it on the site, but I took it down because I wanted to focus on the core features at the start, is to build those kind of collaborative materials. So I have a flash stacks uh, feature, um, so like flashcards that you can create and share those stacks around, uh, creating actual courses, which would be sort of like review spaces that you can um, you can uh, contribute to. They can, those can be voted up in the comment section on there and also quizzes that you can create. So you can create a 10 quizzes or 10 question quiz, share it with your friends, and everyone can kind of take that. So yes, definitely. Yes, please. Uh, Tom University recently announced that they're doing like SAT prep classes and things like that. Do you think that they might go in this direction and become competition for you? Well, they're going to have to pay me a good answer for me whether they should go in that direction or not. But um, I will say that as far as MCAT.me's positioning for companies like that, that we're not, well they're not profit, but uh, for Khan Academy that wants to provide those kind of online tools for them, this is really sort of like a node or a centering point. Uh, one thing I created about when you're creating individual study sessions, you can reference outside pieces of the internet that you're going to be using with that prep. So you can either say, I'm using my Princeton Review Book, Chapter 3, or I'm using Khan Academy and here's the URL and I can easily click over to it. So I'm definitely um, looking forward to getting a lot of integrations from a lot of those tools, because they're already out there, but students are sharing them separately. They need to be able to talk about them together in the same place. That's my goal. Yes, 
if you consider any, is there any opportunity for like um, uh, more of a like, two-sided marketplace? Like, like companies like Me Mega Study in Korea do a billion dollars selling basically kind of lower end tutoring services. Absolutely. Like, having all the data and having yeah. folks and teachers make a few million dollars right now. That is another part of it I want to get involved is to definitely have a marketplace where you have tutors coming in that can specialize on certain topics or it, it can also be referenced within the community. And those tutors, again, uh, going back to the question over here, are going to be able to create content on the site and perhaps even market that, sell that to them. Okay. <coughs> Yes, please. How are your test scores acquired, or are they user reported? They are user reported, yes. So that's pretty much how collaboration has worked with uh, students on the internet so far, is everyone just takes everyone else's word for it. So hopefully we'll keep that up. Yes. There's a suggestion for people that might misbehave you. You could have like a reputation system where if somebody consistently misbehaves, they could have like a low reputation. Yeah, I think that's a good idea. I don't for, for the record, my idea would fix that problem. <laughs> 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 a conversation idea. Absolutely. All right. Question four. And I'm along the same lines as reputation in terms of, I guess, for lack of a better word, intelligence, or if you're making quizzes, like the basics versus advanced stuff, is there going to be moderated or ranked? I would really like to see just how it all works out with students getting into it, because the whole idea is that you'll be able to tie this in eventually with how they actually did on the real test. So that when you look at a study plan, you're going to see how that student did in the end. And you can copy that study plan yourself and use it in your class. Thank you. All right, thank you. I just wanted to quickly say that we are always looking for additional presenters for uh, HU Tech. Uh, if you are a Ann Arbor area uh, company and would like to present, please email organizers at hutech.org. Uh, it's also on the hutech.org uh, website. Uh, so thanks, everyone. See you next month.